I'm Ricky Francisco, the curator of Foundation Sanso, a small, private not-for-profit institution running a museum, an archive, and a grants program to preserve and share the legacy of Juvenal Senso. And in today's episode of Cultural Cash Online, I'll be talking about a work by Juvenal Senso from the Cultural Center of the Philippines Collection entitled Icaro y los Papalotes, or Icarus and the Kites. I've only seen Icarus and the Kites and the other painting by Senso in the CCP collection called Tree of Life as digital photographs. Prior to this, I've only seen Icarus and the Kites as a black and white picture in the 1976 book Senso by Alfredo Rosses, where it was chosen to be a spread beside a chapter entitled The Anatomy of Anguish. Seeing the colored image now, I can better imagine why it was chosen for the book. Despite not seeing the work in person, I chose to talk about this painting in particular because there is something in it that I have not seen in the over 5,000 works by Senso that I have seen so far. What is unique about it is that unlike most landscape paintings by him, this has a person in it, though we only know it because of the title and the silhouette of this winged figure flying above the rubble, whom we assume is Icarus from Greek mythology. The unique characteristic is something we will look more into after we have gone through some other works which we can compare this painting to, particularly those from the Brittany and Barong Barong series, which are stylistically related to Icarus and the Kites. Many associate Senso with his more popular painting subjects, flowers and the coasts of Brittany. These were constant themes of his local gallery exhibitions from the 1960s to his retirement in 2012, not because of the lack of other subjects, but because that was what galleries and collectors asked for. But when I look back on the works of Sanso as a painter, I resonate with his bold, black period works from the 1950s and 60s, which were often angsty and existential and could easily fit in today's contemporary art scene. Many works from this series were about people, like Nocturnalia, which is now in the Paulino and Hetike collection, and Joyride from the Lopez Museum collection. Black period works often had grotesque interpretations of people from real life. Simultaneous to these early paintings of people, alongside the Brittany and floral works that he was already exhibiting, he also made dark, Philippine-themed landscapes dominated by the Barong Barong, or shanties, and baklad, or fish pens, from 1957 to the early 1970s, a great example of which is the Red Sunset from the Ateneo Art Gallery collection. Many of these kinds of works do not have people in them. Aside from painting, he also had a lot of other creative pursuits which he excelled in, like printmaking, textile design, opera set and costume design, photography, painted slides, reprographics, mosaics, and fresco. It was a natural thing for Senso to be engaged in a lot of other practices concurrent to his painting practice. Because he was entirely homeschooled prior to his enrollment at the UP College of Fine Arts in 1948, and Senso stressed the importance of experimentation in learning and in his art practice. In the nine years I've been working on the materials at Foundation Senso, I realized that his practice of printmaking, textile design, and photography strongly informed his painting practice in the way he composed the painting, the way he built up the layers, and the techniques he used. For example, in Icarus and the Kites, we can see that the highlights on the rocks, particularly the frontmost, were not painted over with a lighter color. Rather, they were achieved through scraping off wet paint or masking off the highlights to reveal the underlying lighter layer. In a similar way, he would remove the ground on his copper plate etchings to create highlights in his fine art prints. 
This is the same technique he used with the Barong Barong paintings and the Brittany series, which came about after his first return to Manila in 1957. Being in Paris for nearly seven years, away from his family, friends, and country for the first time in his life, allowed him to see everything again in a new light upon his return. Among the things which fascinated him were the weathered baklad that dotted the coasts of San Dionisio Paranaque and the Barong Barong, which was still very much present around Manila because of the war. These would find their way into his painting soon after, but would disappear in the 1980s. Of the Barong Barong paintings, Sun said in his 1964 Cleveland Art Museum solo exhibition, Manila happens to be one of the most thoroughly destroyed cities during World War II, and what was left of the inhabitants picked up the charred remains and started to build shanties upon shanties of ghost town, a horrible beauty. To add to this, the curator Luis Richards wrote, Sanso shows the world as a limbo hovering between day and night where living creatures do not exist, but inanimate objects become prime actors. Sanso's formal color drawings and paintings show the world transformed to twilight landscapes where decaying shanty towns assume majestic size and appearance, and where beached boats or rocks or shrubs emit a brooding presence, neither evil nor beneficent, but alien to our everyday experience of stone and wood. Sensuas Brittany works testify that perhaps here he has found the most eloquent expression for his sense of mystery and tragedy, and too of the abundant beauty and vitality of the earth. Which brings us to Icarus and the Kites that, like typical Brittany and Barong Barong paintings, uses layers of rocks of similar rectangular planes to highlight distance and nearness, but unlike them, has a suggestion of a human figure in it. This painting was exhibited at the Luce Gallery in June 1970, except for the lonely figure of a man unnaturally flying, silhouetted against a vast sky, with distant kites dotting the fiery red heavens, we can say that it is the weathered rocks looking like rubble of a ruined city or a grand megalithic structure that is the focal point of this painting. Despite a superior force that wreaked havoc on the structure they once were, they are still there. The rocks retain some semblance of what used to be ordered rows, dotted by what could have been columns of wood and bamboo. We can see this in the many Brittany paintings that came about a little earlier and thereafter. There are structures like chimneys on top of the rubble. Like in Barong Barong paintings, the rocks and wood nearest to the front are heavily detailed, while those at the background are made hazy, implying distance. The red sky sets a dramatic, if not an ominous tone. Looking at it reminds me of photographs of Manila right after the war and fills me with sadness, then horror, and then awe. There is beauty to it, but more aligned to the Japanese aesthetic of wabi-sabi, a beauty born out of weathering, impermanence, and suffering. I can just imagine what trauma Senso went through during the war, when he got beaten up by the Japanese as a teen for his blue eyes and the color of his skin, and just two years later, barely surviving a bomb which exploded just 12 feet from him, killing the man beside him and giving him permanent scars. Bombed, burnt buildings were all over Manila then, and the experience of war really marked Senso in both a figurative and literal sense. The red skies in the painting, could they be a deep memory of the red skies of Manila as it burned for three days and nights? And then there's Icarus, alone in the vastness of the sky. Flying sets him apart from other people, do his wings allow him to escape to freedom, or is he doomed like the landscape around him? Does Sansor relate to him in a personal way? I recall what Louis Richard said about Sansor's imaginary world as a limbo hovering between day and night, whose beauty contrasts tragedy with the vitality of the earth. Although Sansor's landscapes originated from his careful consideration, sketching, and understanding of the Brittany coast, Richards and other curators like Emmanuel Torres look at the landscapes as metaphors for the immensity of nature and the solitude it inspires. For Sanso, they were a way of expressing his trauma and anguish. They were also 
a becoming which linked him, the outsider, to the world. For me, Icarus in the Kites allows us to connect with his trauma and resilience. It is a window to an exceptional man's soul. Thank you for joining me in this episode of Cultural Cash Online.